All right, so we'll call the meeting to order for Wednesday, December 16th, 2020. And I just have the formalities. This meeting is being recorded. Uh, in attendance is myself, David Phil, Joyce Chungalo, Jane Nevinsmith, John Waskevitz, and Christian Stanley from the Select Board. All votes will be taken by roll call, called by Jennifer. And I think that's about it. So first order of the business tonight is the consent agenda. We don't have any minutes tonight, but we do have warrants. PR2112, AP2124, AP2124S, AP2125, AP2125S. Uh, we have a Veterans Service Intermunicipal Agreement. The select board will sign that. And then also James Jakanowski, DPW General Foreman. Uh, he has successfully uh, completed his probationary period. So we'll appoint him as a full-time status as a general foreman. So moved. Any further discussion on those items? I can second that. Oh, sorry. Any further discussion? No? Okay, all those in favor? Jennifer, you wanna? Uh, Phil? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Wiskevitz? He's, uh, I think Steptal, he, uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, Nevin Smith. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next we have public comments, 15 minutes max. Limit your comments to three minutes each. Is anybody here for public comments? If so, turn on your camera or raise the uh, virtual hand to let us know you're here. I'll just say one quick thing. Um, the I want to thank the Sportsman's Marina and also Mark Britton and uh, I guess a bunch of others from the uh, Connecticut River Rats group who did the annual Christmas tree over by the, uh, the Coolidge Bridge. It's a, I guess, a solar powered Christmas tree this year with a lot more lights. You'll see that sitting out there on the river. And so uh, thanks for their usual efforts of getting that out there. Looks great. And there's one in North Hadley too, yeah. North Hadley Pond. That's right. So very nice also. Um, could we just take a second while we have a couple of minutes with the comments? Um, it was brought to my attention. That's why I was a little bit late getting on. Um, I have received a phone call from someone that had been walking around um, the uh, path behind the school. Um, major concern with this snowstorm that there are still some barrier things that are up there. Uh, we did open the gate that goes down into there. Um, but there's still some things that are, um, I would call probably dangerous that are on the field. I'm not sure what our liability is, or is it just po we should be posting signs, use at your own risk. Um, what's our liability as a town on this piece of property? We didn't get any comments, and I don't know if the school committee is on tonight. Uh, about what their thoughts were about people going across there on the snowmobiles. I know they always have, um, but seeing this is all new grass and property, I'm just concerned about the destruction of it already when we, it hasn't even been put into full use yet. So I do have some concerns about that. Money, don't want money to be, have been spent for nothing. David, did you have something? So if the project is still gone going, the, uh, the property is in the hands of the con general contractor and the general contractor assumes the liability. If the project is completed, then it belongs, the project belongs to the town mm -hmm. uh, and we get one free pass. If somebody, uh, if we if learn of an obstruction, somebody gets hurt, um, we are not liable. But if that happens a second time, then we are. So we can go out there and uh, rectify whatever the problem may be. We may want to work with the school department and I certainly would like to have some um, comment from our lawyer about should we have postings up um, about using the property or should we say not to use it? I hate to do that because it's always been used by snowmobilers forever. 
Um, I'm just concerned about this year um, when it hasn't really seeded and taken off. And, uh, and if you look towards more the spring when you don't have uh, 8 to 12 or 16 inches of snow on that piece of property and it gets down to being just like uh, semi-snow, semi-dirt and you got people going across it, I think it's going to ruin what we've already done. So, you know, I think we need to take this into some type of consideration sooner rather than later. And it's probably too late at this point, but we still need maybe to do something. Um, any thoughts on anybody from anybody? David, you snowmobile and, you know, and I used to snowmobile myself. So I, I, I get it. I understand. I'm, I'm just concerned about money spent and money being wasted. So any thoughts? Yeah, I think it's probably too late for tomorrow, but yeah, uh, I think the school should, or, or we should get a sign up there. I know we talked about opening the gate just so people wouldn't hit that new gate. That's in the typical pathway everyone uses. Yeah. Um, but excuse me, I can address that, that, that gate in particular. And Chris, um, I think, um, Chris was part of that conversation with Annie. If it's the right, uh, the right bridge, I'm still getting familiar with the, the town area, but, um, I know Annie was very concerned about everything that you're mentioning and she did, I think Chris, she worked with you. I, it might, I'm not sure who put up some reflector tape and, uh, some signs up as well. I, I know that they were working on that. Chris, do you have an update on that? Yeah, we we uh, we uh, took care of the gate. I forwarded you the picture and also to Dave Nixon, uh, to Anna also. We uh, the scope of work that was given to us was just uh, the gate and also the the narrow path, but we weren't told to go into the field, so we didn't do anything in the field. Isn't there an organization of snowmobilers that we could ask to pay attention when spring comes and not ride on that in respect for letting us letting them use it all the rest of the time? It's not necessarily that organization, Jane. We have young kids that don't belong to that, and they're they usually are the ones that are out riding in that field. So, um, I, I think by maybe having some news bulletin or something out there where. Uh, people can see it, the parents or somebody, so that they can pass it on to the kids. Um, if they're kids, aren't they in the school system and we can reach them that way? We could, if they're either there or Smith School, one of the two. It depends where they go. Well, I think we should, you know, use that as an avenue for access to their... I'll, I'll reach out to the uh, Hadley Snowmobile Club and just reiterate to them to send out uh, there's a Facebook group for that and some other groups. So I'll have them send out some information to the members, just reminding them that there's new fields, new grass there to keep off it. And then I guess we can probably talk to Dr. McKenzie about addressing it with the students as well. Okay. That sounds good. Just so we're all aware and it can be put out there at some point about it. Thanks. I can follow up with Annie tomorrow on that. That'd be great, Carolyn. Thank you. Any other public comments before we move on? Okay, um, let's real quick, let's do the deputy town administrators re report update real quick because this I believe is David Nixon's last select board meeting with Hadley because this is our last meeting for, uh, for the year. So David, I'll let you give the update. Well, gosh, thank you. Um... <laughs> and I won't even object, David. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so uh, it's been about a, four months since my last report. So we have a bunch of updates here. Um, we do have uh, uh, COVID-19 issues. We're going to talk a little bit about that later on today. So I'll just mention that the University of Massachusetts uh, asymptomatic uh, testing site is up and operating and is available to the public. You need an appointment. And I've provided a couple of uh, links to both the UMass uh, link and the uh, Commonwealth link. Um, just moving it forward, I don't want to repeat what we're already going to talk about today. All right, Moody Bridge Road, the flap grant project is substantially complete. The three uh, buildings, fire substation, the library, the senior center, substantially complete. Uh, we are 
preparing uh, two bid packages for the old Goodwin Library building. We have money from town meeting for both a design for an elevator, as well as uh, upgrades to the electrical ceiling system and the ceiling in the uh, old library. Town hall pillar painting uh, is on hold until spring for, for warmer weather, but we have a general contractor for that. Cemetery restoration projects are active. Uh, we're going to talk about North Hadley Village Hall uh, sale uh, tonight. Um, let's see. Uh, the adult use marijuana, we had awarded a contract or a permit to Hadleaf, and they have uh, um, they need now to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals in order to establish a where they're finally going to be. They're not going to be in the mall at this point. So we've got a lot of work to do with them. We applied for the Community Compact IT grant for implementing the next phase of our five-year technology plan. Unfortunately, that grant was not awarded. So we'll reapply in the next round. Same deal with the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Grant. We applied for $300,000 for drainage control. Those, that was not funded. Uh, we're going to reapply for engineering design of the Connecticut River levee in the next round. Um, the DLTA grant for working on model solar bylaws is almost complete. Uh, and we'll be presenting that to the uh, planning board. Stormwater permit, we're still working, uh, still on schedule to completing that in a five year uh, period. FEMA flood insurance mapping project. Um, the planning board is working, uh, taking the lead on putting together zoning bylaws that need to be adopted at the uh, annual town meeting coming up. So it's a lot of work that's gonna be done there. They're working with PVPC in order to bring that project forward. We're going to talk about the Route 9 widening project tonight, so I won't get into that. Um, our revenues through November are um, looking basically good. Our tax, tax collection and state aid are right on target. Our local receipts are a little anemic. They're about $100,000 short of where I thought we would be. That may be because we've had uh, an election, two major holidays uh, in there, as well as a spike in the coronavirus. Uh, we'll be watching those numbers as we move, go forward. Expenses are trending downward, uh, or they're not, I should say that they're not keeping pace with our expectations, which is a good thing. We're about $100,000 shy of where I thought we would be this time of year. And our enterprise fund revenues and expenses look good so far, uh, particularly water and sewer. The revenues are exceeding the expenditures, um, which is a good thing for those budgets, but we need to pay attention to those budgets. FY22 budget preparation is in swing at this point. Uh, the town administrator and I are working on two different kinds of budgets. The town administrator is working we're on a level services budget and I'm working on a level funded budget as directed by the select board. Um, and uh, the town administrators uh, plan to start the budget season on January 28th is a very good, good uh, recommendation. Uh, by that time, we'll have the governor's budget, the municipal revenue growth figure will be out, revenue consensus figure figure will be out. We'll have six months of Hadley's revenues and expenditures to, to examine. Uh, then that information will help guide uh, good decisions in the coming year. Uh, building projects going on. Our audit is in full swing and we expect that to be completed in a few weeks, uh, going very smoothly. Uh, and then the senior center and the library are providing services that are not open to the public, but if you go on their websites, you'll be able to uh, uh, enjoy their services. December 19th, we have a public auction of real estate at 6 French Street, um, and uh, there's a link to that uh, information. April 13th, we have annual elections, and May 6th, we have the annual town meeting. And that is my update. All right. Thank you, David. All 
right, so moving on, we have a 545 appointment for the affordable housing trust use proposal. Uh, we had our first meeting of the uh, trust committee on December 8th. Um, our first order of business was to organize and Christian was uh, elected as chair of the committee and uh, Bill Dwyer was, is the uh, clerk. And so uh, I'll, Christian, I'll let you take it from here if you want and kind of introduce what we did and go from there. Yeah, so we basically, as you guys know, we established the Affordable Housing Trust. I think it was at the Springtown meeting. It seems like so long ago now, um, like David was saying. And so basically with this trust, uh, we have the authority to spend money on affordable housing and that money needs to be spent either through a town meeting vote or can be approved by the select board. Um, so having that trust available and a lot of the money from that's established that trust right now is from the uh, Barry Roberts development, excuse me, I'm not remembering the name of what it's called uh, on East Street, um, but basically in lieu of putting an affordable unit there, he's paid a certain percentage into uh, tr this trust that we can use for affordable housing. Um, there are some details we still need to use, work out with those funds because they're currently in, um, oh boy, why am I forgetting the law firm? My memory is not working well tonight, but it's in his law firm's uh, escrow account right now and it'll come to me in a minute. But uh, it's, it's there um, and getting the money is a little bit of a trick right now, but we're working out those details. Um, so anyway, the uh, Affordable Housing and Economic Development Committee came to the Affordable Housing Trust requesting funds for a um, rent, uh, rent, rental assistance um, that can help people uh, make rent uh, for, I think it's three months or $3,000 maximum per individual. And so uh, the Affordable Housing Trust voted to fund um, that project for up to $50,000, um, kind of on a trial basis, because this was supposed to be something that was taken to town meeting, but we uh, had the quorum check uh, before this article was presented to town meeting. So there's a little bit of a stopgap to see how many people will apply, um, if it's something that people are in need of, um, those are the basic things. And then once we know that, we can either ask CPA for money at the Springtown meeting or possibly fund it again through the Affordable Housing Trust. But for now, the idea is let's see how it goes and see if we can get money through CPA in the spring if more is needed. But 50,000 might be a good number to start with and all we need. So what- How are you how are you making that determination? Are you still working that out or who qualifies for it? So the, uh, the program would be, um, would be run by community action or community action of Pioneer Valley. And so they would be administering this, these funds and they would be taking basically 12% to administer the program. Um, so if we figure, $3,000 per applicant, $50,000, um, you're looking at, you know, around uh, 16 or so applicants, um, probably 15 once you take out the cut. So, you know, we're kind of figuring out how, if, if the community really needs it and even talking to CAPV, and I can let other people talk here more because they know more about it. Um, you know, they also don't know how popular these programs are going to be because they're running similar programs in Amherst and East Hampton right now. Are they, but these are just for Hadley residents. This, what we would be funding would just be for Hadley residents that reside in Hadley. Okay. And uh, Molly or Dylan, I don't know if you guys want to, describe more about the program. You're both here, I know, and you guys can probably talk to it a little bit better. Does that include students? 
it's residents of Hadley. There's certain criteria. Molly, do you know what the criteria is off the top of your head if you have to be here for a certain amount of time? You might be muted. I think I have this down by now, huh? <laughs> um, uh, Dylan actually did a really nice um, summary. So Dylan, would you mind just kind of quickly going through the criteria for, you know, median income and that kind of stuff or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so CAPV uh, is working off of what they've done with Amherst and East Hampton already. Uh, and what they look for in order to uh, evaluate a potential applicant uh, is that they are a resident of Hadley uh, and they'll use a, a license utility bill lease document as part of what they collect. Uh, and so they'll use those to check and verify. Uh, income, they're also looking for an area median income of 100% or less for the area. Um, hardship proof, uh, so the loss of income, uh, increase of expenses, uh, is another thing that they will look for, uh, as well as need, which they establish need by having one month behind in rent, uh, which is, uh, th so those four things, residency income, hardship proof and need um, are what they look for. And uh, yeah, as Christian was mentioning, uh, one of the hardest things CFPV has uh, run up against is trying to determine the need for an area. Um, which uh, Christian didn't mention, but the $50,000 that the uh, trust was able to uh, approve for this fund uh, would get put back into the fund by May 31st, 2021. Um, so it does have a short window. Um, and yes, if, if it does work out well, we'll probably approach it uh, as we intended through town meeting uh, and then asking money through CPA, the original course. Okay, thank you. Bill, did you have anything to add as far as uh, process here or how this came to be or anything? Um, <clears throat> not so much to process, but I, I do have an issue um, that I want to discuss. I, I had originally posed the question to the administrator and the assistant administrator asking for an opinion of counsel as to whether we could, uh, as trustees, under the terms of our trust, entertain an application for rental relief. A, uh, an opinion of counsel was returned, uh, I saw it today, um, and it doesn't, it's not responsive to my question. It, uh, the opinion of counsel is that we don't have to go back to select, to uh, town meeting for further approval. That was never a question. Uh, it was pretty clear from the terms of the document that we don't have to go back to town meeting. Uh, what they did not answer was the question, the threshold question of whether it is within our jurisdiction authority as a board to enter into a rental relief agreement. So um, I would appreciate if the question could be reposed to town council with the specific uh, focus on whether we as a board have the authority to make such a, um, to, to take such a vote. So what we could probably do tonight is approve this contingent on town council, go ahead, right? Yeah. Just so we can keep things moving in the meantime. And I'll follow up with that. Okay. So I guess what we have is, uh, Bill, do you, do you have the, the motion in front of you? I, or handy, is it in here? Um, it is not in there. Um, I have been shuffling stuff all over my desk. That's okay. So, um, well, basically what we're looking for from the select board this evening is uh, approval to, um, I guess, ratify the Affordable Housing Trust's um, actions of allocating $50,000 uh, out of the trust to be used for rental assistance through CAPV. And if those funds are not used by May 31st, 2021, they will be returned to the trust. So, I'll make that motion. Okay. I'll second. 
Okay, motion by Jane, second by Joyce. Any further discussion? I just, I'll let you guys know too, and Bill, correct me if my number is a little bit off, but the trust funds right now are around $300,000, roughly. So, um, you know, we'd be using 50 of that 300,000 up for this. And uh, one thing I just, we have to add to, I guess, to that motion is this is contingent on town council approval, so. Just a friendly amendment there. Town council or town meeting? Uh, no, town council. Uh, this is, we have the authority by town meeting to expend the funds. We just want to make sure we're okay doing so with the trust language, right, Bill? Correct. Okay. Okay. So basically in order to expend the funds, both the trust committee and the select board have to approve it. And then it doesn't have to go back to town meeting. Okay. And then just a, another logistic there is just to try to move this along, you know, I'd like to give maybe David the authority to sign off for the select board once we get approval so we don't have to come back to us in a month or whenever it is we meet exactly so that we can try to get this moving, you know, sooner rather than later. I'll, I'll second that, uh, Christian. Jane, you okay with that amendment, those two amendments to your motion? That's fine, yeah. All right. All right, so if there's no further discussion, um, Jennifer? Bill? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, Dylan and Molly and uh, your committee. Thank you for your work on it. Yeah, thank you for the support. It's really appreciated. And uh, Molly, before we let you go, would you mind giving a quick update from UMass? Uh, sure. Actually, I'm going to hang on um, while Mike does his update on the ambulance too. Oh, okay. All right. But um, the quick update uh, for the university is we had the CCC meeting. If you recall, that's the uh, campus coalition that was originally formed to curb um, high-risk drinking behavior. Um, it's actually... I, didn't even realize until Tony Marula said it today, it's been in the um, existence for 15 years now. Um, and for 14 of the 15 years, that's exactly what the focus has been, you know, with um, the work Sally Lenowski does and everybody, uh, the various police departments talking about how that's, um, that curbing has been going of, of the bad behavior. So uh, this year has been one, uh, as you can know, is dramatically different because with the absence of the students um, being around for the bulk of time, uh, the issues with high risk drinking really have been effectively non-existent. Um, however, police and public safety and all of the um, public health officials at the university have been focused obviously on COVID-19. Um, I think the this was the last meeting of this year, and the takeaway um, from the meeting really is um, quite sadly what's happening is the uh, the call volumes are down, which is good, but the nature of the calls where we are seeing a significant uptick, and this was reported both by Hadley and Amherst and the UMass Police Department, are really mental health related. Um, so there's a lot of concern about the infrastructure in place to um, work with people. Uh, I mean, again, the focus of this group is on students, but I think we're seeing it in the greater community. People are really, really struggling right now. And if it's not um, a call related to mental health, a lot of times it's related to substance abuse and a significant uptick in that arena. So, um, you know, not, not a great message, but I think people recognize the need to continue to work together as a community, as a greater community, um, and do everything we can to um, support those individuals who are in need. So um, other than that, the um, off-campus requirement, uh, off-campus students will continue to be uh, required to test and quarantine um, in isolation if, um, as COVID continues, as we get into these darker months. Um, and then on a business standpoint, the um, director of the bid in Amherst reported that there are seven businesses that have um, 
permanently closed and seven to eight more that are um, closing temporarily. And we're likely to see more of that again over the winter months as uh, the business owners try to figure out how to stretch what dollars they have um, without having the, the business activity. So I think that's about it. And what about the people with asymptomatic can go to the Mullins Center for testing? Yep. Thanks, Joyce. So I believe that opened up on Monday, uh, this past Monday. And Correct. if you are asymptomatic and a member of the, again, the greater community, um, you don't need to be affiliated with the university. You can go online to UMass's website. Um, so they have a, a COVID website and you can request an appointment. So you, you know, don't just show up because you're not going to be able to um, be seen, but you can go online, make an appointment and get that testing done. Thank you. All right. The family doesn't have any more questions. Um, any well, does anyone have one question uh, for Molly? When do the students come back? Do you know? Um, I believe it's February 1st, but, um, and, and, I, and I missed the dates. One of the things they were talking about today is they're, what they're trying to do is stagger the students coming in so that the students actually are there in advance of when the classes actually start. So that if they have students potentially moving on campus, and I believe um, 5,500 is the rough estimate right now um, that they're planning on having in February. So if they're coming from hotspots or, or high risk areas, obviously the concern is that, you know, somebody coming up from, you know, Miami or wherever uh, may be bringing bad things with them. So what they want to do is make sure that there's the opportunity to have these kids tested immediately. And if they test positive for COVID, they immediately go into quarantine to, you know, to really kind of control that spread. So I think, I think my understanding is that they're going to become staggered move-in dates as a result of that. Okay. Anything else on the UMass? No. All right. Well, thanks, Molly. And uh, real quick, let's try to squeeze in the ambulance uh, update. If, uh, Chief, you want to take that? Sure. Um, so the Ambulance Oversight Committee met yesterday with myself, uh, Molly, Keegan, Hank Barstow, Barb O'Connor, and then members of the uh, of Action EMS. We had the president, Mike Rowanka, and his uh, financial officer, Robert Zern, and supervisor, Rock Tebow. Um, and we went through the finance, uh, the financials for fiscal year 2020, so that's uh, July 1st through June 30th. And as part of the contract, we have a look back period of time uh, because it takes them time to process and receive insurance payments. So the look back was through mid-October, was actually, which was actually beneficial to us because uh, it allowed a little bit additional time to get more revenue in. <clears throat> so the uh, obviously this year due to COVID, the uh, the, the numbers are down. There was a lower response uh, rate in, you know, March, April, actually through June. Uh, so our total bill, billings, the net was $810,000. Uh, they collected $571,422. Uh, the town subsidy, which is what we paid out as part of the contract for FY20 was 282000 So the total was 853,672. Um, the, according to the contract, we have established a rebate. Uh, so that rebate basically is triggered when they hit their mark that they need, which is $714,750. So we are looking at a rebate to the town this year of $138,922. Um, so obviously it's less than last year. Uh, last year we received the full rebate of 267,000. Uh, but this year we had some pretty substantial issues with COVID. Um, again, we are looking at, um, some other items that were reported. We are looking at a, a and Molly, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we're looking at about a 5% increase in calls going up now. Uh, however, um, we were, we were substantially down. Um, 
They are looking at, uh, they did report that the state is looking to possibly be doubling Medicaid rates. Uh, they're almost, they've almost finalized that, which would be a positive for us next year. Uh, however, Massachusetts still needs to apply uh, for this with the federal government. So we're hoping that that will, that will, uh, will happen. Uh, that will boost our, our number, hopefully. Um, and we will have another look back period in December, according to contract, uh, to see if there was any residual money. Uh, basically, they will be, they do attempt to recoup funds for about two years. And then the, if they don't get it after that, it becomes much more difficult to kind of recoup that. So our number again this year, our rebate will be 138,922. Decent amount of money, absolutely. <coughs> okay, anything further on the ambulance? Uh, just a couple, a couple items uh, just for, for everybody at home. Uh, again, our response times. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> Bad. I'm response good. times have continued to be uh, spot on. Uh, we are looking at an average of a, just over a five minute response time, uh, which again uh, is much improved from uh, our past responses. And uh, again, our continued thanks to the, the folks that we do have that are part of our team here, uh, including our, our, fire, our own firefighters who are going out on all these calls. Um, just wanted to say thank you like I did last night. We had uh, two instances where we really had our folks step up for the community. One was um, uh, was Mr. Uh, Shumway with his ALS with getting, you know, action stepped up with us to get him to his new home. Um, and also for uh, Mrs. Boysvert. And I just wanted to say thank you to action and to our crews for, for organizing that and making that happen. Okay. Absolutely. Chief, you want to uh, talk, we'll go down to uh, business not anticipated real quick before our appointment here at uh, 6.15. Do you want to talk about the surplus equipment that you're asking us to declare? That, that would be great if that's okay. Uh, just quickly, um, as in the past, uh, so the, the new North Station, obviously, we are operating out of now, so our Engine 3 is able to fit in that building. And so finally, you know, three three years late, uh, we are looking to declare our engine two, which is a 1987 Pierce Arrow as a uh, surplus. I did send, it was a little bit late, but Jennifer has it and I believe you have it now. Um, that piece of equipment will be going to auction uh, as along with some miscellaneous fire department equipment that's up in the old North Hadley station. Uh, miscellaneous tools, ladders, hose, and firefighting equipment and racking. Uh, and then also, excuse me, with that uh, park and rec, I've met with park and rec up there multiple times and, and the commissioners, they've pretty much taken out everything that they needed also have had multiple um, tag sales. So the remaining stuff, I met with uh, Doug Billadu yesterday and walked through and they will be, <clears throat> excuse me, picking up any items that are uh, that might bring something at auction. Uh, so I'm asking that basically anything in that building be declared surplus at this point. Um, there's really not much over that $500 threshold uh, unless we get lucky, um, but that will all be brought up to Doug Billadus for, uh, for auction. That's the first request. Sounds good. Make a motion to accept that. Second. All right, motion by Joyce, second by Christian. Any further discussion on those items? Jennifer? Bill? Yes. Shangalaya? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. And that is it. Okay, yep. Uh, the second one, Mr. Chair, is the uh, declaration of our Hearst extrication tools. Um, they were purchased in 1993 by the Hadley Volunteer Firemen's Association and gifted to the town. Um, these are our oldest sets. And while they are still operational, we have done um, up, 
updates to ours with uh, battery operated as well as a set that we had purchased as part of the build out of, um, we have one older set that's still in service. Uh, and what we're looking to do, excuse me, um, as I provided all the information, including the uh, the canceled um, money uh, money order that was uh, presented by the uh, Hadley Volunteer Firemen's Association for it, but we're looking to transfer this equipment to the town of Sunderland. They do not have um, working extrication equipment. So we are looking to have you guys approve us uh, donating this to them. Uh, the positives of that is they are our neighbor to the north. So if we are requesting mutual aid from Sunderland, they would be bringing equipment if we needed it uh, that we're already trained on. And they are very, very excited that we thought of them. And I think this is in the spirit of what we normally try to do. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that you were good with that and uh, approve that request for surplus. And this is this extrication equipment is known as the jaws of life for people at home, right? That's correct. It's a pair. It's a set of cutters and spreaders, our, our oldest set. Okay. I'll make, I'll make a motion. motion. All right. I heard Jane first, so. Oh, stop it. <laughs> You can second it though, Joyce, if you want. I, I would like to second it, but I'd also <laughs> like us to put on a Merry Christmas tag for Sunderland. Um, I, I think, Mike, that it would also behoove us to share that, you know, not only do we share what we have, but when we were in need, as you said, when we needed a ladder truck, Amherst donated one to us. So you know, in the spirit of community and what we do for reciprocation throughout our community, it certainly is a nice gesture on our part. So I thank Mike for thinking of it and I'm sure Sunderland is happy. Yes, definitely. They are very excited about it. And we have already discussed having some um, joint trainings as we train quite regularly because of the number of accidents we have uh, with extrication needs. So we'll be working with them so that they're familiar with the equipment. And uh, the only part that's not going to them is the airbags that have been taken out of service, but the town was generous to support us on purchasing those, those new life-saving pieces of equipment. So we're, those are actually in the process of being ordered. So thank Great. you to the town for that. Thank you. Okay, motion by Jane, second by Joyce. Any further discussion on this? Uh, Jennifer? Bill? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Okay. Chief, do you want to anything about North North uh, Hadley Station uh, before you get out of here? Sure. If Joyce is okay with that, I just I did receive today one piece of uh, information, which unfortunately it's not great news, but we're trying to find a solution. Uh, the production of the fiber has been delayed a little bit due to COVID. Uh, they are trying to find an alternative solution, but our fiber roll that we need to actually string it between departments uh, is a little bit behind. Uh, they're looking at a possible January uh, delivery date, which is about a month behind from what we thought. Um, so we are, we are working with uh, the company on trying to find solutions, but just wanted to keep everybody updated on that. That's fine. Mike, did, how about um, what we talked about with, um, the ambulance. You think this is the right time to bring that up? As far as the um, purchasing, yeah, actually, we it's up to Carolyn if she wants to discuss it. We did we did send a letter of intent uh, with the caveat of of funding, and we are working on a solution to that okay. right now. Um, but we have uh, we do have the opportunity uh, to uh, to purchase a. Um, a used ambulance from the city of Northampton, which is in spectacular shape, which we would not see the likes of again anytime soon. And they've they've kind of put us at the top of the list for it. Uh, we will be putting together a complete package to present to you on that, so that you have all the information and how that would how that would work. That would be a happy New Year. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Chief. Rest up. I bet you got a busy day tomorrow. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> All right.
<laughs> Thanks. Let's go. Uh, let's move on to uh, 5.2 Applebee's change of manager. We have a 615 appointment for that. Um, Jennifer, is that person here? Is that Scott? Yes, I'm yes. here. Okay. Great. So we have uh, Apple New England LLC, DBA Applebee's Neighborhood Grill and Bar has submitted a change of manager request for Scott Buckland as the new manager. So Jennifer, do you want to chime in or? Um, I'll just say that the application is complete. Um, and Scott and I've talked a couple of times. Um, if the application looks good. I think we can go ahead with it. Scott, anything you want to say real quick? Uh, I'm just glad to be here in that tablet. So I'm enjoying it so far. All right. Sounds good. Well, if I could get a motion to approve this, please. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Motion by Joyce. Second by Christian. Any other discussion? All right. Jennifer? Hill? Yes. <coughs> Chungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. And Nevin Smith? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate you coming on for a minute. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Have a good night. All right. So we'll move on here to, I guess we got to wait three minutes for the uh, Texas Roadhouse hearing, but let's do um, license renewal. Jennifer, you want to do that real quick? Absolutely. Um, so the list that you have there um, are the ones that came in after the date of the second. Um, we have probably about six outstanding. Um, and as of right now, no one has indicated to me, to me um, that they're not gonna renew. So I might have a different story um, at the first meeting in January. But right now we look good. So I would ask you to accept the list of licenses and to renew them. So moved. Second. Motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any discussion on these? Jennifer, will you call that one? Bill? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. And Nevin Smith? Yes. Thank you. And we've still got another minute here, so let's skip down to... Um, Is John with us tonight? He, he's listening, but he's uh, waiting for a delivery truck of some sort that he has to unload. So he's, he's here in spirit. Okay. Spirit. Uh, <laughs> Let's do a 6.5 annual town meeting warrant. Uh, we are, the select board is asked to open the warrant for the spring annual town meeting. And uh, we'll most likely be closing this on February 2nd, 2021. And, uh, so moved. Okay. Motion by Joyce. Second. Second by Christian. And Carolyn, anything you want to say about this or? No? Nope. All right. Just leave that open. Jennifer? Bill? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes, I'll try to extend my yes out to just get another minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and uh, Mrs. Jane Nevin Smith. <laughs> yes, I think I'm going to vote positive. <laughs> All right. Well, according to my computer here, it is now 620. So uh, we'll move on to Texas Roadhouse change of beneficial interest. We have a 620 posted appointment. Texas Roadhouse Holdings LLC DBA Texas Roadhouse has submitted a change of beneficial interest. This is a statewide request that has already been approved by the ABCC. Jennifer, anything else on that? There's really nothing else to it. Uh, this is a routine thing. Um, Texas Roadhouse actually changes this I think about once a year. Um, Andrew Upton is here, their attorney, but um, I think he'll tell you it's pretty standard. Uh, Andrew, anything you wanted to say? Uh, just to let you know, this is a officer change at the corporate headquarters. There is no change to any aspect of the license premise in Hadley or any license premise in Massachusetts. Okay, easy enough. I could get a motion for that. So moved. Second. Any further discussion on this? Jennifer? Bill? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Stanley? 
Yes. Y'all moved on my screen. <laughs> All right, Andrew, thanks for showing up and uh, have a good night. All right, thank you very much. All right, thanks. Good night. All right, so let's, uh, let's move on to Human Resources Department 6.1. Uh, Deb Radway is here and we have some requests uh, to make some changes to the personnel policy handbook for comp time and uh, vacation carryover for town employees. So Deb, do you wanna talk real quick about uh, what's being proposed? I'd be happy to. Thank you very much uh, for letting me come before you tonight. We have, I have several items for your consideration. The first, as you said, is pro proposed language revisions to the personnel policy regarding uh, compensatory time. And um, this recommendation is made to you by a working group of town staff who have recognized that there are existing misunderstandings and problems with the current use of comp time um, throughout town government. The, the working group members, many of whom I see are hiding behind their names here tonight, are Tommy Quinlan, Mike Spank Nabal, Dee Dee Dabrinsky, Dan Zadonik, Linda Sanderson, Chris Okafor, Jennifer uh, Sanders James, Joan Zuzko, and myself. Um, just, I don't know how much detail you want me to go in here because I'm HR and I'll talk forever about stuff I'm passionate about. Um, if, but I just happily hit the highlights. And if you have questions, we can talk about it. Does that make sense? Perfect. Or do you, okay. Um, there, are, there are three areas of proposed changes to the personnel policies handbook. Um, there are a little bit of, of changes in the definitions, in the pay policies, and the compensatory time sections. And these three areas uh, reflect a combination of simple wording clarification and then some substantive policy changes. Uh, and we're making these changes because there are over two dozen individual employment contracts that uh, in the town, the schools, the libraries uh, that talk, that each have referenced their own version of compensatory time. We have the personnel policies handbook, and then we've got all the, the union contracts and they all have different language too. Our, our goal here is really to update the language in the personnel policies handbook so that all future employment contracts in the town can just reference that language and not negotiate individual arrangements with each employee. That's really kind of where we're, we're going with this. Um, we've evaluated what other towns do, what the Fair Labor Standards Act does. We've examined all the different practices used by the town of Hadley, uh, some comp times. And it's kind of within that spirit of trying to um, do right by people, be fair to the taxpayer, and um, be within the law that, that guides our recommendations. And I would also say that we took these recommendations to the financial management team uh, last week. They reviewed them all. They made a suggestion for improvement that is incorporated into what you have before you. So um, in the definitions section, what we did is we updated the definitions of exempt and non-exempt employee consistent with the language of the Fair Labor Standards Act. And when we're talking about compensatory time and overtime, we're talking about the federal Fair Labor Standards Act. In the pay policy sections, the language is administrative kind of adjustments to reflect that we do direct deposit now, that we pay biweekly instead of weekly, that pay is uh, coordinated by the Human Resources Department and not under the Treasurer's Department. And we're recommending some adjustments to the timesheet submission itself. The major changes are in the in the compensatory time section, and both how we accrue comp time for non-exempt staff, and then what we want to do with exempt staff. So for 
non-exempt staff, they will still be able to, uh, there's no changes, they'll still be able to accrue straight time, uh, accrue uh, time up to 40 hours at straight time. If they had a 35 hour schedule and they work 40 hours, they get paid straight time up to 40. And then uh, they can accrue as they do now up to 40 hours of comp time. And as they do now, they get to choose between whether they want that at overtime uh, or at comp or at comp compensatory time. Um, the big change that we're recommending is if they're required, if a non-exempt employee is required to work over 40 hours and they have already accrued 40 hours of comp time, that they will automatically be paid overtime after that. And we will also trigger a management review if we're getting close to them accruing 40 hours of comp time to look into what are the factors that are contributing to this employee having to work uh, over and above their standard work hours. Uh, is, it, is it increased responsibilities? Is it absence by some other employee? Is it a budgetary snafu? We, we wanna guarantee that the employee has a meeting with HR with a, or with the town administrator with their department head to look at the factors that are contributing to why there's comp time. So that's the big change for the non-exempt staff. Uh, for the exempt staff, we're recommending eliminating comp time altogether and replacing that with a kind of a two-phased approach. Flex time for working within their pay period. If they have to work late extra meetings, they can adjust their time during the day and just let folks know what, what they're doing. Or if there is an extraordinary event uh, like what's going to happen in the next 24 hours, or there's a, a major fire that the employee will talk to Carolyn ahead of time, will talk to the town administrator saying, hey, I'm giving you a heads up. We've got an event that's happening or after, immediately after the fact, if it's already happened, and, and talk through what what occurred, why there was nobody else able to carry those hours and why the, the management now worked those hours. And then they will um, be given extra time off to be used at a time convenient to them that the town administrator knows about, um, but doesn't accrue and get paid out. It's just reciprocal time off. And it's for major events and it's mostly for essential personnel. And that's what we're recommending doing. We're recommending that this start January 1st, 2021, or at the expiration of any individual employment agreement that's currently in effect that has language that's contrary to what we're recommending. So somebody has got an employment agreement with different comp language that doesn't expire for another year, there we, we would honor that employment agreement for that duration. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts. If there's folks who are on the committee who wanna jump in and say whatever I've forgotten. Let me uh, ask someone to make this motion and second it. And if we have any more um, discussion, we can do that. So I need someone to move that move. adopt the revised compensatory time policy dated December 16th, 2020, as submitted by the Human Resources Department to incorporate it into the Town of Hadley Personnel Policies Handbook, effective January 1st, 2021. I'll move that. Okay. I can second it. All right, so motion by Jane, second by Christian. And if anybody wants to chime in on that. So, yes. So this is, this is uh, 
taking out union things. We're doing side letters with unions. So this doesn't affect the unions at all. The unions all have their own existing collective bargaining agreements and we okay. honor them. This is solely for non-union personnel. We okay. will get to the next topic I'll talk about is those individual union agreements. Okay, thank you. Any further questions or comments on this? All right, Jennifer? Bill? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Thank you. All right, on to the next thing, Deb. Okay. Um, the next thing is uh, we have three non-union, non-exempt personnel who have accrued an excess of 40 hours of compensatory time this year that by the end of this year, they are not going to be able to get below 40 hours. And because of the extraordinary work that these folks have done uh, to address their department's needs during COVID, we are asking that you let them carry over comp time balances over 40 hours for non-exempt, non-union personnel from 2020 until January, uh, June 30th, 2021. And this is one employee in DPW and two at Town Hall. And the town administrator is working with all three of them um, on making sure they have a plan to reduce their comp time balances. And this is down from a list of uh, probably 12 or 14 folks a couple of months ago. So people know what they need to do and are using that time. So moved. I just have some language. Uh, I need a motion to adopt the one-time carryover of compensatory time balances over 40 hours for non-exempt, non-union personnel from 2020 until June 30th, 2021. So moved. Second. All right, motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any further discussion on this? Jennifer? Bill? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Hungalo? Yes. <laughs> Nevin Smith? Yes. You moved again. It's not my fault. <laughs> I'm here, right here. We're looking at me. <laughs> oh, all right. I got it. <laughs> all right. Okay. Hey, lastly, in the, in the same vein, but uh, on, not on compensatory time, there are about 27 town employees who currently, and this is across all the unions and non-union exempt, non-exempt, who have not yet gotten their accrual balances of vacation time below a half a year accrual. And it's all because of COVID that the demands on them and their departments have been so extraordinary this year that they just haven't been able to use vacation time. And in some cases, the department heads have restricted the use of vacation time. Um, so um, I have a, another request to carry over unused vacation time in excess of the half a year that the personnel policy allows. And furthermore, um, each of the town's unions has made a request to uh, carry over specific leave. So the, the DPW union would also like to carry over unused 2020 vacation time that they have not been able to use to June 30th. 2021. The police union uh, would like to carry over vacation and holidays that come at the end of the year that they haven't been able or they won't be able to take before the end of the year. And the dispatch union uh, would like to carry over up to three holidays from 2020 into 
2021. So um, that's that in a nutshell, nutshell package. I know that the chairman has a big motion to read. <laughs> I do. So Joyce, hold off on your motion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I need a motion that in recognition of the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic and the limitation of town employees to use accrued leave leave time during 2020 uh, to approve the carryover of 2020 vacation balances in excess of one half years accrual for non-union, police union, and DPW union employees until June 30th, 2021, and the carryover of unused 2020 holiday pay for police and dispatch unions until June 30th, 2021, and to further authorize the chair to execute agreements with the police, dispatch, and DPW unions to this effect. So moved. Second. By motion by Joy, second by Christian. And any questions or comments on this? My, my only question is, and, and maybe this is something we can think about at a longer term, but with these and expiring in June, you know, I just don't know how much the virus is going to let up between now and then where we can just take a vacation, go on vacation, anybody for an extended period. So just not that I'm going to vote against this, but should we be thinking about a payout or some other means besides extending these times for people. But I again know that the budget and other things are tricky um, right now, but um, just throwing that thought out there of, you know, uh, we're, we're kind of passing it along, which I think is good. And I do hope everybody can take a vacation day and we can resolve it. But what do we do if June comes and still there's this bank of vacation days and comp time and all these things. I think Christian and I'm being very hopeful and optimistic. I was going to save it till later, but um, now with the vaccine out there and people being able to take it within this community, I know we only have a limited amount that was distributed to Cooley at this point, we only had 305, but it's going to be a weekly distribution. So I think, you know, as the, as the weeks and things go on, that come the first part of the year that we're going to be in a good place that hopefully more people will be vaccinated. And I think by the middle of between March, April, that, you know, we, we might be in pretty good shape. Um, and I'm hoping that that's the case. And I, I like that light at the end of the tunnel. And that's what I'm hoping for. We did talk about this in our in our working group, and we wanted to try and keep a little bit of pressure on to folks to 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 use that time up. I yep. mean, re realistically, even if you can't go anywhere, um, you got to take a day off and do some yard work or shovel some snow or something like that to burn it up. Right. Because, uh, eventually, we got to catch up here <laughs> for yep. for for that emotional health as well as anything else. Right. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I'm not arguing that. I think people should be taking days off just to decompress a little bit. Yeah, for yeah. sure. You know, there's more than just physical illness out there. We have, you know, a lot of psychological stuff that, you know, a day here and a day there certainly gets you a chance to reboot. And that's, some of us just need that. Well, thank you very much. I really would like to applaud the work of these the the working group people they met five or six times and they did their research and homework and it was a real a real tribute to be able to work with them. Jane, did you have a, a comment or anything before you vote or no? Okay, Just, uh, Jennifer, will you call the vote? Bill. Yes. Chungalo. Yes. <laughs> Stanley. <laughs> yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Love you. <laughs> Thank you. And can I just say that Deb did an excellent job with the work group. It was really, it was really great to work through the process and see how it, it would go. And I really enjoyed it. So thank you, Deb. One, one more step toward a uh, more streamlined and standardized uh, process for the town. So it's a, it's a step in the right direction. Great. Thank you. Right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Deb. Uh, we'll move on to, let's do, uh, is Dr. Moser here? Yep, she's here. All right, so let's do um, 
COVID-19 update 6.2. Uh, the select board will review the town of Hadley's response plan for COVID-19. And uh, we have some changes from the governor's orders and um, a variety of things to talk about. So let me start off by saying uh, Unified Command met last week and we had a discussion of possibly making some changes to the town's reopening plan. And so uh, Dr. Moser, maybe you wanna start off the conversation here about what, what the changes are and, and kind yeah, of- what just, uh, share a little bit of, uh, of information here. Thank you, David. Yep. Um, the uh, you know, COVID-19 infection uh, rate is uh, increasing in the state and in Hampshire County at an alarming uh, rate right now. Uh, thus, uh, the, the rollback of our reopening plan. Uh, the governor uh, re rolled back, I guess, about a week or so ago. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any huge impacts on uh, restaurants or the big box stores. I mean, there's some decrease in maximum capacity, you know, occupancy of, of these uh, types of places. Uh, the restaurants remain open for indoor dining. The gyms remain open. The you know all the retail stores remain open. Uh, I think arcades are closed. There was a closing of a, of a few things, but uh, um, the right now, uh, Cooley Dickinson has uh, as of a few days ago had 16 COVID cases. Uh, I think four or five were in the intensive unit there still is capacity uh, for more uh, in the Cooley Dickinson uh, ICU which uh, which is a good thing uh, I want to report to everybody we have had many 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 businesses restaurants and retail uh, in Hadley with COVID positive employees so the the virus is amongst us uh, also, uh, nursing homes in Hampshire and Franklin County, which had been spared, uh, now also have uh, multiple cases in uh, almost all of, of the nursing homes. Uh, I know here in Elaine Manor, and there's a few up in Franklin County, and I think multiple uh, facilities also in Northampton, both employees and uh, spread among uh, amongst the residents there. Uh, you know, um, Northampton and Amherst Senior Centers are both closed for in-person activities at this time. Isolation and, uh, and loneliness have uh, significant impacts on people's mental and physical health. And I think the select board needs to keep that in mind when thinking about uh, our senior center, certainly, whether to keep it open or closed. So that's certainly something to consider. Uh, the, the other side of it is uh, regarding this, I know that this, the senior center was discussed at the, at the unified command meeting, uh, that, uh, you know, we need to, the select board needs to consider the ramifications uh, of a situation where a senior uh, is infected with, with COVID-19, uh, coming into the senior center, being near other people, people uh, also going you know at their home because they are uh, often visited by uh, you know visiting uh, healthcare professionals they may have a personal care attendant they have families who look in on them uh, you know we've had 300,000 deaths now in the United States 60,000 of those are in people younger than 65 and many of those are were previously young and healthy people. A lot of them are were healthcare workers. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's a it's a complicated situation. And um, sharing this information, and uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I would let the select board. You know, you can discuss amongst yourselves and and decide what you think is best. So one of the questions we need to determine tonight is, uh, do we need to make any changes to the town hall? Currently the town hall is open for appointments only. Uh, do we want to make changes to that? Do we want to make changes to the limited programming at the senior center? And I think the library is still remote 
or just pick up only, right? Okay, so probably probably no issues to, to change there. But uh, Senior Center and, and the Town Hall, I think uh, we got to decide whether we're going to stay the course or make some changes there. So take it away with the discussion. I think like uh, what they're doing with the schools, I think they're waiting for that um, 3% marker that the school has um, set as their bar. Um, they'll know tomorrow night if they're going to cancel school on Friday, Monday, and Tuesday, from what I read from um, Dr. McKenzie's uh, report that she sent out to us the other day. I am truly concerned about not exposing anybody to any more than we have to. Um, it is out there, um, and I agree with Susan, Dr. Mosler, um, the hospital is at capacity right now. Um, all the floors are pretty full. And every single day, the emergency room is seeing not just COVID patients, but we have an extraordinary high amount of multiple different types of diagnoses. And we also have a lot of psychological patients that come into the ED. This has really been an extraordinary time at this point that we need to make sure that we are keeping our community safe. I think in closing our senior center and our town hall until the first of the year, January 4th would not be a bad thing. Um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Mosler, do you agree with me? I, you know, I, I have to say, I, I, I don't wanna weigh in on a right or a wrong. I, I think, you know, I, I, I gave you the information. And, yep. um, I mean, certainly your, certainly your expertise and, you know, listen, between if, me if and I, looking. If I were the ahead. governor, everybody would be at home. So. <laughs> me too. <laughs> so, but, you know, as, as business goes on as usual, because that's what we try to do, uh, and we certainly want to try and make it as safe for everybody as possible. And I think, you know, shutting down until after Christmas wouldn't be a bad thing. Do you? I mean, that's what I was, that's what I was thinking. If, if we were to do this, I would just say, let's look at January 6th as a date. Cause our next meeting is January 6th. So I wouldn't want to say okay. January first and have things go downhill, but we're, you know, we can talk, Jane, I'm sure you have some comments. So let's, let's keep the discussion going before we do that. Yeah. I would, I would like to let Haley speak because I know she has things she wants to say. Yeah, please. You're muted. Thank you. My internet is a bit intermittent. So forgive me if there are some moments of silence. Um, I will comply with whatever the overall recommendation is for, from tonight um, with, you know, respect for the expertise and the cautions that um, select board might want to apply to the senior center. I, I do feel comfortable about the level of activity that we're hosting right now and the um, ample spacing um, between um, very small groups of people. There are never more than, there are probably never more than, um, 10 to 15 people in that building at a time, mostly far fewer than that. And we've worked to really space things out so that there's time that people don't spend more than a half an hour in a room. Our classes are a half an hour long. Um, surfaces are disinfected after, after people have been in rooms like our fitness room um, and for, for, and we've also developed a specific protocol if Hadley um, elevates um, its numbers into um, the yellow zone. So we've thought a lot about um, how to respond. Um, in that instance, we would close until there are at least two weeks of, um, of numbers being back in the gray and the green zones. Um, and we've thought a lot about what happens if we learn of a close contact or a, a volunteer or a staff member or a family member of a staff member um, having, a, having a, a, a positive test result for COVID. Um, so I do support our maintaining our level of activity at its current level. We haven't had any scares yet, knock on wood. Um, 
It may be that that's a matter of time before that changes and we have to enact a protocol that calls for closure. Um, but right now I feel like what we're doing is keeping a valuable new resource um, active in a really minimal way and yet giving everyone who's 60 and over an opportunity to see the building and experience the many things it has to offer. Um, and it keeps us vital and it keeps our ability to serve um, you know, kind of active and in play, which feels good. Um, so that's, you know, so I, I'm defending staying open um, to the level that we are, um, but of course I will respectfully comply with whatever you choose. I have a real fear. Uh, we have gotten through Thanksgiving. We've had an increase in the uptake of COVID. Um, and sometimes not by anybody's fault, but I really truly feel that taking a two week break or until our January 6th meeting would certainly be a good thing for the town of Hadley to just make sure that we are all safe. I think everybody doing online, uh, communicating that way, I just feel like Personally, I think that's the right thing to do. Um, being in the health care field and seeing the surge that we've seen over the last few weeks certainly makes me know that people are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that was just with Thanksgiving. We are now hitting the, the Christmas season, the holiday season, where people really feel like they need to be together. And I have real concerns that they're not going to do what they're supposed to do. Um, that's my only take on it. And it's my greatest fear. And I get it. We've had enough of it. We're sick of it. But, and then people are letting their guard down. And, you know, this is not the time to let that happen. You know, I'm, I'm speaking from the heart. I'm speaking from, it's not necessarily the seniors there are a few seniors that have COVID. I see that. But there are the younger, the 50 to 60 year olds that are the more vulnerable lately. And they're the ones that are the ones that are the sickest. So, you know, you have, and I, I, I just feel like we should do our due diligence and just take a break. And through this holiday, see if we can get through it with a vaccination and see if things can get better. I just want us all to be safe. And that's that's where I'm coming from. Chris, uh, you guys I agree with you, Joyce. Yeah. I agree with Joyce. We've had a, two or three scares done at DPW. We've had two or three scares at the town hall. It just, and the numbers are going up. I mean, it's undeniable here, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I, was, I think, I think we... I think we need to look as a board, not only about our town, not only about our town buildings, but about our town businesses and restaurants, specifically restaurants and inside dining. Takeout would is still probably okay, but it's more and more that I read, it's people going to restaurants and maybe having a drink and getting a little looser. And that's where it's spreading. Groups that are staying together without masks. That's what happens. No. No, I went to Applebee's um, probably two weeks ago, and you couldn't have been more safe in that restaurant as if you were eating in your home. They did everything possible. They took your name. They took your number. They did contact uh, information, who you were. They put you in a booth that you were not sitting near anybody else. You're every other and the, you know, the waitress wore a mask. I think they're doing everything possible that they should be doing. I don't, I don't think wrongly of any restaurant. They think they're doing what they need to do to survive. So don't, don't condemn them right now. I don't think that's the issue at this point. I think it's people gatherings and different things of that nature. It's not a restaurant's. I, I don't think we have the authority anyways to, to shut down the restaurants as uh, a select That's board. The governor. That's the governor. 
right? But no, could, you, you wanted to say something? The, the Board of Health can do that. Right. Oh, no, thank, no. thank you, Susan. But, you know, in going to Applebee's, which I hadn't been um, to a restaurant in this area um, since the start of the COVID, and to tell you the truth, I felt very safe in there. I think they did a great job. I was just going to say real quick that I do agree, you know, I'm kind of on the fence about the senior center, but I do kind of agree with the sentiment of where everybody's going that I think we should probably close it down for two, three weeks until our next meeting. As much as I think that you guys are doing a really good job keeping people safe, I just would hate for there to be something that happens with people visiting relatives over the holidays and, and somebody getting sick. Yeah. I don't know. It's just really scary. And it's like that double-edged sword where I think seniors especially need some social activities right now because it is so isolating and it's so challenging. So yeah. part of me that feels for people that are isolated, that don't have somebody to talk to on a daily basis yeah. and those kind of things, I feel really bad, but I don't know, as a, uh, being on the select board, I just feel like we got to kind of say, all right, you know, the senior center isn't necessarily a place for that right now, as much as we feel bad about that. Uh, it's a tough decision. And we're at, uh, we're, at risk enough, we're, we're at risk enough with our es essential employees. And, yeah. And, 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 and we've been lucky with that. Town hall to me is kind of a no brainer. I mean, we don't really have a lot of tax bills due. There's not a lot going around. I'll, on around the holidays as far as why people would need to go to town hall. So town hall to me is let's just, you know, shut that down. Employees can come to work, but you know, um, people could work at home if they want. Uh, you know, we don't need anybody from the general public coming into town hall. I don't think right now. As I say about the senior center, the holidays, I would rather be around for next year than to worry about this year. And I think that if we take that and make sure that people know that we are at their um, thinking of them at the most high, that we want them to be here next year. So if we have to skip this year, if we have to wait a few weeks for the senior center to get up and rolling again and know where our numbers are at that time, I think that that's more important than, than keeping it open at this point. So just to be clear, uh, if we were to close these departments, Senior Center and Town Hall, the employees would still be working, still be providing services as much as they can. It, they would just not be open to the, to the public to come into the building. Right now, the Town Hall is by appointments only, you'd still be able to use the Dropbox, people would still be able to answer phones and issue, you know, building permits and things like that. So we're, we're Absolutely. not- Absolutely. Right. And they still can do their um, Zoom meetings, whatever they have, their contacts that way, so people can get onto that that way. Um, that's, that won't stop. But I think in person right now, I think we need to be extremely cautious. The what hospital, about? the hospital is full. All I can say is the hospital is full right now. And, you know, they're even putting off doing inpatient surgical procedures because we don't want people to have to stay in the hospital if you're healthy. All these elective surgeries are being postponed because we don't want you to have to stay. One day surgeries are still going on. But other than that, we, we are extremely full. That's all I can say right now. So from the beginning, including in March, the Senior Center has offered uh, foot care, which is essential for seniors. Is that something you're also going to cancel? Can we postpone them for two weeks? I mean... We run three, three days a month. We're doing foot care. And... So people are pretty much on a system and if, especially the diabetics need to have their feet checked. I'm sorry. I, I would just chime in here that I think that uh, podiatric care like this would, should be considered an essential function. I agree with you, Dr. Mosler. There are certain things that you need to look at 
not certainly classes or different things like that, but if you're having a podiatrist see a patient, then mask, get in there, do what you need to do, and then go home. Absolutely. So we don't have any motion on the table yet, but if someone was to make one, I think we should reassess on our January 6th meeting. And if we were to make changes, then they would, you know, we could make those changes for the seventh. So if someone wants to make a motion one way or another. I can just make a motion that we, you know, close town hall and the senior center to the general public, except for essential services until our next, and we can reevaluate that decision at our next select board meeting on January 6th, is it? Yes. I'll, I'll second that, Christian. Okay. Motion by Christian, second by Joyce. And any other discussion or comments? No? Okay. Jennifer? Hill? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Abstained. Wiskevitz? Yes. Thank you. And uh, Haley, I just wanted to say uh, thanks for, uh, you know, I know it's tough trying to run a program remotely, but uh, thanks for keeping everybody safe and the, the time that you were able to, to reopen. And hopefully we'll have you back up and running again soon. Because uh, actually, do you want to share some of those numbers? Jane, you had some good numbers of the number of seniors that were stopping in. So that way people... You can do that, Haley. Yeah. And? <laughs> well, I I haven't brought in my, my stats. Um, I remember them. But I think that we probably served over 100 unique individuals in the last month. As I said, it's very, very well spaced. Um, and, you know, we, we do consider and, and we still have a, our transportation program is, is you know, beginning to, to pick up a little bit. I consider that an essential service. And that doesn't involve people visiting the senior center. Um, and we have, you know, 10 regular riders that are depending on us for that. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just not really prepared to those stats right now. But you do understand, Haley, that we want you to continue with essential services. I, I completely understand. So as I, and I've, they're, I think, well-defined and as discussed, foot care can be among them. So I'm glad about that. That's great. Okay. Thank you. We're not trying to shut you down. That's for damn sure. No, no, my feelings are <laughs> hurt. I know you're doing this for the benefit of, of the public and older adults, and um, I respect the choice. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. I'm an elder. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's move on. Let's hit uh, liaison. Well, actually, is there anything else we need to address for uh, the for COVID, Dr. Moser, did you have anything else you wanted to chime in on? Or? Nope. Okay. All right. Well, then we'll keep Thank moving. Thank you, everybody. On. Thank you. Right. Good night. Thanks. Uh, well, let's do the liaison reports real quick. Um, not much going on. We'll just go, go through the list here. Not much going on with DPW other than snow removal prep. All the roads are pre-treated. The... Um, uh, crews have been out doing pothole repair the last week or so. Um, and, and just basically doing storm prep. So um, if we get the 10 to 20 inches they're calling for, it could be an interesting day tomorrow and tonight, but um, that's all I have for DPW. And we know what you're going to be doing tomorrow. Got that right. <laughs> Snowmobiling all around. Yeah. I'll go down the list here. Uh, Christian, uh, General Government Library, anything you want to update on there? Yeah, I mean, general government, I think we've gone over a lot um, already. Uh, and library is very close to being out of the good win. I think they just have a little bit left to move, but they're hoping to be fully into the new library uh, by the first of the year, come the first of the year. And then um, trying to think what else. They're, they're open for curbside pickup. So if you would like a book, you call, um, ask for a book if you know, or if you uh, need help finding a book, they'll help you. And then you just go and pick up the books. Um, and that's about it, I think, for it right now that I can think of. Jane? Well, the school board, as you all know, is working overtime, maintaining 
uh, metrics and reviewing them constantly. And I have to say, I'm really impressed with the effort that they all put in and the hours they spend in meetings. And you already heard what's going on at the senior center. So those are my two major. Okay, John, you have uh, Park and Rec, Hadley Media and Veterans Affairs. Anything from there? Oh uh, yeah, I tried to contact Park and Rec, but I haven't been able to get through to them. Um, uh, Veterans Affairs, I seen something that wasn't sent to me uh, about a mutual aid agreement or whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, with Northampton and a few other towns. I did read through that, but uh, I didn't, I can't elaborate on it, just what I read. Okay. And then uh, Joyce, public safety, what do you have over there? I think we covered it all tonight between Mike and the ambulance and everything just uh, moving, moving along smoothly. I think everything is going good. All right. So we'll keep going then. Um, we talked about the North Hadley substation. We talked about, uh, well, Jane, do you have anything from the senior center as far as the project? No? Okay. The senior center is doing fine. We're, I mean, we got one of the things we've been waiting done today, which is finally the uh, lock to fit in the pocket door between the reception area and the office area. Okay. There's still a little few little things they're working on. And uh, Christian, any updates on the library? The only thing I had was that um, there's been some questions about the one-way roads and whether to have arrows painted on the driveway or have some more painted on or some signage. And I know the trustees <laughs> voted against the change order the other day um, to put to paint arrows on the driveway right now because it's so close to winter. I mean, um, it's kind of hard, but I think that there might be some requests coming down the road. And Jane, you might know more from talking with them and other meetings you've had about possibly just like working with the DPW to put up some signs um, for the one way or do not enter um, that are closer to the entrance and exit there. Yeah, we, we talked about that at the last big meeting, if you will, that both entrance and exit need one-way arrows because yeah. the, the one-way information doesn't start until you're well into the parking lot. I see a few arrows around the building, but they're not, I don't believe they're complete to go all the way around the library or around the horseshoe at the senior center. So they're, they're a little confusing right now the way they are. So. Yeah, so in, in the spring, we might be able to do more painting on the road, and I think they have to come back and do some paving anyway. Um, and, and then the signage, maybe, maybe if we get more detail of what we need, the DPW could just put up some signs instead of having the contractor do it. The other... The other thing is Joanne Konetsky and I have been talking and we're going to try and put together a parking policy for that lot, um, which we will bring to the select board in terms of who can use it when. And for instance, if one of those two buildings, library or senior center is having a large event, then we are gonna need to make sure that residents aren't doing parties that day or whatever. Okay, move on to 7.2 on the agenda, which is uh, Russell School Letters of Interest. I'll just quickly say we had two people responded or two organizations that responded and they will be reviewed and uh, uh, requests for proposals put together. But I think that's about it for now. But the good news is we did get some response on those. So, uh, so that, that's progress. Um, Let's do 7.3 Mass DOT Russell School and Middle Street intersection. Um, most people are probably seeing by now that the no turn on red signs from Middle Street North and South onto Route 9 have been removed, meaning that you can now legally uh, make a right turn on red. Uh, just remember you can't do that when pedestrians are present, so watch out for people crossing there. 
Um, but Mass DOT requested that the Porter Phelps Huntington House sign that is in front of the old Goodwin be moved uh, a little bit to the north to improve the sight line. Um, that's something that the uh, the DPW can probably take care of here after after the snow um, sometime in the future. The, the Porter Phelps Huntington House does not have the resources or the ability to do that themselves at this point. So um, just want to, I guess, get a vote from the select board to, to move that sign by the DPW at some point, even though it's not a town-owned sign. It yeah, is I can, town property. can make a motion to move that sign north. Do we have a distance? Uh, 20 feet, or is that enough? Uh, I think it's just a line of sight they wanted in a letter. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just make a motion to move that sign, the uh, Porter Phelps sign north, so it's out of the line of sight. Site. Second. A motion by Christian, second by Joyce. Anything further on this? Jennifer. Phil? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. Thank you. All right. So real quick uh, announcements, just a reminder, we have uh, 6 French Street is going up for auction on the 19th. So you can check the uh, board docs for a, a link, I believe, to find more information about that auction. But we're hopefully going to finally get rid of that. And anybody else have uh, any other announcements? Were we talking about the North Hadley Hall at all tonight or is that off the agenda? That's uh, executive session. So, oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll move into that just after the announcements. Yeah, I would just say for an announcement, you know, support your our local restaurants, even if you can't go in person, you know, still continue to buy food to go. All the restaurants in the area are doing to go food. And uh, with your Christmas shopping, try to support the local businesses as well. They could really use it right now. David, if I can just, one thing that I wanted to add that I, uh, I wanted to let the board know that Parks and the Recreation Commission did hire an interim uh, program coordinator for 19 hours and Melissa Aloisi was, uh, had done it previously and they've hired her temporarily as they look at that position and how to repost it. Okay, thank you. Any other announcements? I, I do have some announcements, is that okay? Absolutely. Okay, so um, we have a few passings uh, within since our last meeting. We have Rosalind Zajkowski, and we offer our condolences to her family. Abida Mohammed, we pat uh, her. Uh, we offer her condolences to her family, and then Marie Quill, uh, we offer her condolences to our her family also. And then there was also a Nathaniel Grandanison. Um, so offer our condolences to them. It's a hard time of the year to have anybody um, pass. And I just want to I just want to take a minute. Um, I also have um, a thank you to Gardner Supply on Route Nine, who has continued Tom Giles and Janine Giles' um, tradition of giving a uh, wreath to our town hall. So I do want to thank them, but I don't want to be amiss in not being able to thank all of our businesses that we have in our town that have stepped up to the plate over this COVID um, year that we have had, and they have been outstanding. They have donated to our public safety, um, restaurants have donated food. Our um, residents have bought food and given them to our, our uh, public safety and people. Um, so I, I, I want to thank everybody for doing that. And in, 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 the, in the spirit of this, um, just let us take a moment of our time. I'd like to uh, reflect on this past year. Uh, it was a year like no other that I have seen in my lifetime, and I'm the oldest one on the board. Maybe I want to think about disagree. that. Disagree. Oh, disagree. Are you older than I, Jane? 
well, yeah. I'm close behind you. But anyway, <laughs> I, I, I think it's time for us to reflect on this. And uh, we hope that we never see a year like this one. Um, it was a year of tragedy. We have lost many of our town residents, not necessarily to COVID, but we have had an unusual amount of passings in our town this year. And um, I certainly want to think of our, all of our memories of people that have passed and to their families. And I want to wish them um, some type of, um, what, you know, solace in, 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 in their passing that they still have their memories to contend with uh, we should remember them as they were, and it's it's good for memories. Um, during this past year, though, we did have uh, an unusual year where Hadley was able to continue on and do business and be uh, a good, thriving town, even though some of our businesses have lost. But think about it. They still donated to our town, and they still um helped us out through times of need um we were able to complete three buildings we completed our senior center first our sub fire station and our library i mean how unusual is that that we were able to have all of these um, buildings completed in a time like we've no other have um have endured um, so thank you to everybody for jobs well done and getting these projects done and so proud of everybody for doing that. We were able to see our children return to school in a safe environment, whether limited or not, they still were able to go back to school. And I thank our school committee and everybody else involved in that, that we were able to um, participate in that and make sure that everybody was safe. Uh, we had a fire department, police department, board of health, DPW that worked endlessly during this time. And we all just stuck together. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better town to live in at this point. So we've had a lot to be thankful for and yet a lot to be sad about in the year 2020. But as we see 2021 coming to um, fruition, uh, I do see a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that 2021, we will be better. We will be united. And um, I just want to wish everybody, you know, a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and be safe. Um, continue to practice your um, precautions, wear your mask, wash your hands, and we'll see you next year. Um, hopefully that everybody will still be with us. So um, that's all I have. So thank you. All right, I have two real quick before we move to executive session. Uh, one is uh, condolences to Carolyn on the loss of her father. And uh, I wanted to say oh. for, uh, even even dealing with all of that, uh, working from afar, dealing with town business. So you know, thank you for that. And then uh, also, this is David Nixon's last select board meeting. So he's going to have a lot of free Wednesday evenings if somebody wants to get him a hobby. <laughs> I don't know what to do with myself on a Wednesday. Um, right. But thank you, I'll David. have him on speed dial. There you go. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, David. Yeah. Thank, thank you, all. you. Thank, you, thank David. you, David, for everything. We appreciate you for sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the kind words. Thanks, David and the support. I got your number, David. You're not very gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> he's not done yet. We, he's helping us out in executive sessions, so he's not done yet. <laughs> we got him till the end of the year, right, Carolyn? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, and certainly sorry about your father. Certainly condolences. Thank you. you. Thank you, but thank you for um, the support of the board for letting me go home last week because I had three. Oh my really good God, family is always yep. first. And I really felt that support and I thank you. And I, I really did appreciate that. Thank you. And David, because David stepped up and just took on everything that I was working on. So that was great. Well, and then there's Jennifer who picks up everybody's pieces. <laughs> yes. David. Yes, yeah, she does. Yes, yeah, she does. 
All right. So next on the agenda is uh, we have to discuss the sale of real estate, which would be the North Hadley Village Hall. So we have a motion to move into executive session. Uh, let's see. The select board will enter into executive session as per the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, Section 2126 to consider the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property if the chair declares that an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the negotiating position of the public body, uh, not to reconvene an open session. So, so moved. Second. And Jennifer, roll call. Bill. Yes. Chungaloo. Yes. Stanley. Yes. 